Thank you so much, Praise Team, for leading us in worship today. I want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10. I want to commence our reading at verse number 24. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 24. I am often asked the questions, why do you still use the King James Version Bible? It's not that I have any problem with other versions. I don't. But this is the version I grew up on. And it's the one I've read all my life and the one from which I've memorized verses. It's just familiar to me. Will you understand that? Is that okay with you if I use the King James Version? All right. I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 10. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. But he, Saul, held his peace. The title of the sermon this morning is in a formal question. Are you following the king? Let's bow together, please, let us pray. Father, I pray that in these next few moments now, that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. We have no word to preach except your word. We have no power in which to preach except your power. And God forbid that we should desire any glory except that you be glorified in this sermon. Accomplish your purpose in each of our lives, we pray in the strong name of Christ our Lord. Amen. It was a sad day for the prophet Samuel. For many years, he had been the spiritual leader of the nation. He had been their prophet, their priest, their judge. As prophet, he represented God to them. As priest, he represented them to God. As judge, he settled their disputes and their arguments. In Samuel's old age, he shared the responsibility of judgeship with his sons, which proved to be a major disaster. His sons took bribes from the people and perverted justice. To add insult to injury, the elders of Israel came to him one day and said, we want a change in leadership. We want a king to be our leader. We want to be like the other nations around us. We want a king to rule us, a king to judge us, a king to fight our battles. Would you give us a king? It broke the heart of God's prophet. He went before the Lord and said, Dear God, the people have rejected me. God responded to Samuel, no, they haven't rejected you. They have rejected me. Tell them they will live to regret having a king. But if they insist on having a king, you give them a king. Sometimes God will give us what we want when it may not be what we need. They were not given the privilege of choosing their first king. He was appointed and anointed by God himself. And the one that God chose was a man by the name of Saul. 
the son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin. On the day of his inauguration, the people stood and said, God save the king, or may the king live long. That is, many of the people did. There was another group that refused to accept his authority over their lives and said, he will not be our king. Now the reason that story interests me is because God has appointed and has anointed another to be king of our lives. His name, King Jesus. There is no way that Saul could be compared to Jesus, but the reason this story interests me is because the same response that Saul got in his day is the same response that Jesus has received in our day. So I want to talk about that today under the title, Are You Following the King? There are three simple things I want to say. Number one, I want to say a word about the reception of the king. Number two, the rejection of the king. And number three, the reaction of the king. Notice the reception of the king. When the activities of the coronation was over, Samuel sent all the people away back to their homes. And then the text says, and Saul went down to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. I want to say something about those men who follow the king. First of all, they were committed to their king. When others went to their home, they didn't go to theirs. When others went back to their jobs, they didn't go to theirs. When others went back to their community, they didn't go to theirs. When others went back to their way of life, they didn't go to theirs. They became the king's men. They said, we lay down our agenda. We're going to follow the king. Whatever he says, we will do. Wherever he sends us, we will go. Whenever he asks us to serve, we will serve. We are committed to the king. Now, if, the earth, if an earthly king could receive that kind of commitment, how much more should the heavenly king have our commitment to him? In fact, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, If any man come after me, and hate not his mother and father, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be his disciples. And whosoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus says to be followers of me, you have to lay aside any relationship. There must be no persons that your affection, that rivals your affection of Jesus. You must be willing to lay down any possession, no possession you must treasure above Jesus. You must be willing to lay down your rights, even lay down your life for Jesus to be a follower of him. Are you a follower of King Jesus? These men were committed to the king. Secondly, they were united around the king. The reason I know that is because they've committed to him. There was a band of men that went with Saul. They had laid aside their own desires. They laid aside their own wants. They laid aside their own ways. They laid aside their own wishes. They laid aside their own preferences and said, we are united to the king because we are committed to the king. One of the great contradictions of the American Christian church is the division and disunity and disloyalty in the fellowship of God's people. The reason I say that is because of this. We say we are the body of Christ. 
and yet the members of the body can't get along. We say we are the bride of Christ, and yet the bride of Christ is fragmented. We say that we are the temple of the Lord, and yet the stones in the temple do not fit. We say we are the army of the Lord, but we fight one another. We say we love God, but we don't love each other. We say we are ministers of reconciliation, and we cannot be reconciled to one another. What a contradiction of the Christian faith and the Christian message and the Christian church. I'm often asked the question, Brother Herman, what do you think will ever unite the body of Christ? I believe it's this. We will never be united around Jesus until we, commit, we are committed to Jesus. When we are committed to the King, we shall be united around the King. I brought a bicycle wheel. See, even bring it to me for, to illustrate my point. Somebody said, why are you bringing a bicycle wheel to church? Well, I want to show you something. You will notice at the center of the bicycle wheel, when the st spokes got close to the center, they were close to one another. When they got away from the center, they were further apart from one another. Would you agree with me? That Jesus Christ is indeed the center of the Christian life? If that is true, then the closer I am to Jesus, the closer I'm going to be with you. And the more I love Jesus, the more I'm going to love you. The more I fellowship with Jesus, I'm going to fellowship with you. And the more that I serve Jesus, the more I'm going to serve you. In fact, if I drift away from my brothers and sisters in Christ, it may indicate I have drifted away from Jesus. Ah, oh, to be committed to the king and to be united around the king. Now, there's a third thing about these men. They were excited about the king. The reason I know that is because the scripture says they were touched by the Lord now, I want you to know, when God touches a heart, that person becomes excited. He can't help it. He'll just be excited. And how do we know that we've been touched? We'll get excited. And how can we get excited? We'll get excited about what touched us. Because we get excited about things that we indeed experience in our lives. For example, if I love golf, I'm going to tell somebody about my hole-in-one. It excites me. If I get excited about fishing, I'm going to tell somebody about the 10-pounder I landed. Am I not? If I get excited about football, I'm going to talk about the championship game. If I'm excited about my grandkids, I'm going to talk about those angels. You know what I mean. We talk about what we get excited about. And if you get excited about King Jesus, I'm telling you, you are going to talk about King Jesus. You just can't help it. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had been touched by the Lord. And when he got the touch, he heard God say, I need somebody to talk about me. And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. I'm ready. I've been touched by the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah said, I, th I thought I wouldn't preach anymore in the name of Christ, but I've been touched. And the word of God was like a fire in my bones, and I just couldn't stay silent. In John chapter 1, uh, Andrew found the Lord, and he came to Peter and said, I can't help but tell you, we found the Messiah. Come and see for yourself. In John chapter 4, the woman of the well got touched by the Lord. And she went back to the city and said, Come see a man that told me all things I've ever done. Is not this the Christ? In Acts chapter 4, Peter and James and John were told not to preach anymore in the name of Christ. And they said, We can't help but tell the things we've seen and heard. We've been touched by the Lord. On June the 28th, 1957, I got touched by the Lord, I'm telling you. At an altar at Talladega at Chaco Springs, on my face for the Lord, the Lord saved me and transformed my life. And I got excited about my king. 
Let me tell you about him. He's a great king. He is. He's the king of heaven. He is the king over the earth. He is the king of the kingdom. He is the king of eternity. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of the Jews. He is the king of glory. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's my king. And I love him. Don't you? Is he your king? Are you following the king? I don't know my president. I don't know my governor. I don't know my senator. But thank God I know my king. I know my king. And here's what's more wonderful. He knows me and my king loves me. In fact, my king walks with me and talks with me and tells me I'm his own. Are you a follower of the king? Committed to him. United around him. Excited about him. The reception of the king. But everybody didn't feel that way. There was a group that said, we'll not have him rule over us all. They rejected the king. They disputed his kingship. Here's what they said. Who is this man? How can he save us? Is not this Saul, the son of Kish, of the little tribe of Benjamin? How can he be our king? He's not, he's not qualified to be king over us. We will not accept. And they disputed his kingship. When Jesus Christ came to this world, born king of the Jews, many of the Jews rejected him. They said, who is this one? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Is not his mother named Mary? Is he not the son of the carpenter? Are not his brothers and sisters with us? They said he doesn't have the right to be king over us. And they disputed his kingship. Maybe you have done the same thing. One may question the credentials of King Saul, the earthly king. But how dare anybody question the right of Jesus Christ to be king over your life? There are three reasons why he should be your king. Number one, the right of creation. Psalm 100 and verse 3 says, Know ye not the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. In John chapter 1, John introduced the, the gospel by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 16 says, all things were made by him and for him. Doesn't the creator have the right to rule over his creation? I think it does. I think it does. The right of creation. The right of redemption. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the apostle Paul wrote, don't you understand that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. You've been redeemed. Therefore, glorify your Lord in your body and in your spirit. First Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter said, We are not redeemed by, by, by things like blood, by, by, by blood, uh, flesh and blood, but we are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a price the Lord paid for you and for me. And by the right of redemption, he has every right to demand to be your king. I must remind him, I don't belong to myself. I don't. I must glorify him in my body and in my spirit. For when Jesus died on the cross, he paid that sacrifice. He paid that payment. And he bought me outright. No longer is it a shared partnership. No, I belong to him completely. He owns everything. My eyes are not my own. They belong to him. I have no right to see anything or watch anything that does not glorify him. My ears have been bought by the Lord. I have no right to listen to anything that does not glorify him. My mouth has been purchased by my Redeemer. I have no right to speak anything except that which will glorify my King. Ah, oh, listen, my hands do not belong to myself. They belong to my King. He bought them outright. And I have no right to do anything with these hands that does not glorify Him. My feet don't belong to me. They belong to Jesus. He bought them. I have no right to go anywhere that he is not glorified. Oh, listen. 
My mind belongs to the Lord. I have no right to think anything that does not glorify Him. My heart belongs to Him. I have no right to love anything that does not glorify Him. He is Lord. He is King. The right of creation. The right of redemption. But then thirdly, the right of exaltation. The reason that Saul could be king is because the Lord anointed him and appointed him to be king. But oh, our Lord Jesus has been highly exalted and given a name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of things in heaven, of things on earth, of things under the earth. He has been exalted. The psalmist said in Psalm 24, Lift up your head, O your gaze, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Lift up your head, O your gaze, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, for the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The King, the, the Lord of hosts, is the King of glory. They disputed his kingship. But not only that, they despised his kingship. They said, King Saul may rule some of the nation, but not all of it. He will not rule us. We shall not bow the knee to him. I want to ask you a question. Is there any place in your life or area in your life that you have not given full authority to King Jesus? Is there? You say he can rule part of my life, but not all of my life. Jim Elliot was right when he said, If Jesus Christ is not king of all, he is not king at all. Does he rule every area of our life? Not just your spiritual life. Oh, yes, we understand. What about your secular life? What about your social life? Kids, what about your school life? What about your secret life? Is he king in all areas of your life? Is he king in all places? Is he king in the home? How do you treat your spouse? How do you treat your children? How do you treat your parents? Listen, if he doesn't have authority in the home, it doesn't matter to me where you think he has authority anywhere else. That's where it really counts. Is he king in your home? Is he king at the workplace, in the office building, on the playground, in the ballpark? When the call goes against you, are you under his authority? What about the marketplace? What about the highway? Oh, I shouldn't mention that, should I? I'm asking the question, is he king of the whole kingdom of your life? In every area, in every place, and at all times. Yes, 10.15 on Sunday morning. What about 8.15 on Monday morning? Is he king? The sons of Belial, the sons of the wicked one, the sons of the, of the wretched one, the sons of the... Belial said, we will not let him bow. We will not let him be our king. We will not bow the knee to him. They despised his kingship. They disputed his kingship. They dishonored his kingship. When others brought him gifts, they said, we'll bring him nothing. We'll give him nothing. What an insult to the king not to give him a thing. What have you given to King Jesus? I want to ask you. I'm honest. What have you given? Have you given your time? Have you given him your possessions? Have you given him your family? Have you given him your career? Have you given him your allegiance? Have you given him your heart? Have you given him your all? To hold anything back from King Jesus, an insult to his grace and his love, because he gave it all for you. How dare we not give it all to him? Well, I've talked about the reception of the king and the rejection of the king. What would the reaction of the king be? Notice the power the king held. He's king now. He has undisputed authority, unlimited power. He could give the word and say, bow the knee 
or pay the consequences. In fact, in chapter 11, in verse number 12, the people said, Do you want us to put to death those who raise the question, How shall this man rule us? All he had to do was give the word. It would have been done. Bow the knee or pay the consequences. Does anybody doubt here for a skinny moment that Jesus Christ could force the issue today if he wanted to? He could have every person in this building on his face before God in one single moment if he chose to. He has that kind of authority and he has that kind of ability. The power the king held. But note the patience the king showed. The text said he held his peace. Didn't say anything. In chapter 11, when they asked him, what us put him to death? Saul said, no, nobody will die today. Because today, salvation has come to Israel. What he was saying was, today is the day of salvation. Ah, King Jesus, one day, will force the issue. You know he will. Because it is true, every knee, every tongue, in heaven, on earth, under the earth. The issue, the question is not will you bow to his authority. The question is when will you bow to his authority. But you will bow to him one day. You can today while it's a day of salvation. Or you will one day when it will be too late to be saved. Ah, are you following the king? The year was 1983. We were living in a little village called Sycamore. Little mill village. I was pastor of the Baptist church there. Been there nine and a half years. Our boys had grown up there. We loved that place. My family was settled. The boys were in school. They were all playing football. David in the 10th grade. Stephen in the 9th. And Timothy in the 7th. Had their friends. We were having a wonderful time. The church loved me probably more than they should have loved a pastor. And I loved them probably more than I should have loved them. But we loved each other. A wonderful relationship there. In fact, I had planned to spend the rest of my life at Sycamore. I had. Retire there. One Sunday morning, four strange men walked into our church. When they left, one of them said, Pastor, we have a word with you after everybody has left. I said, sure. After everybody gone, they came back in. They said, we are a pastor search committee from Ufala. You've been recommended as our pastor. We've been praying about this. We came to your service today to hear you preach. Without exception, all of us feel like you're the man that should be our next pastor. I said, thank you very much, but no, I'm happy where I'm at. I can't move my boys, not critical time in their life, I can't move my boys. Thank you, I'm honored you'd even consider me, but no, thank you, I'm not interested. Pastor, would you pray about it? Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, got me, didn't it? Will you pray about it? Well, <laughs> I kind of crossed my fingers and said, I will, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know how that goes, you know how that goes. You pray, but you don't pray. They called back about a week. Brother Herman, we are more convinced than ever that you're a man. Would you come and preach to our people? No, no. I told you, I'm not interested. Another week passed. Brother Herman, we believe that you owe us the courtesy of coming to meet our people and to preach to our church. I thought about that. Well, that's right. I'll, I'll do that. So I stood in my pulpit in Sycamore and I said, folks, I'm going to you follow to preach at a church that's invited me to preach. But don't you worry. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be back. I'm with you, pastor. Don't you worry. Major mistake. Major mistake. <laughs> well, I came and great fellowship on Saturday night. Great service on Sunday morning. If you were here, that was the morning that young lady, Debbie Howard, got saved. The church voted to call Miss Pastor. I said, no. <laughs> I did. Boy, I'm stubborn. I'm stubborn. I said, no. 
But the more I thought about it, my soul became restless. Maybe I hadn't been honest. One Friday night, I went to my study. I said, Lord, hadn't been honest. I want to be honest. I want to know, is it your will that I move to Parkview Church and you follow? God, would you let me know for sure? Sometime in the morning, I was on my study, on my face, on the floor, crying out, God, I need to have an answer. And clearly, the curtain began to brew back and the clouds began to fade. God said, son, I'm calling you to your father. I'm not happy what I did. I was on my face. I took my fist. I beat the floor. I said, no, Lord. No, Lord. No, Lord. Son, you can't say that. Those words are irreconcilable. If he's Lord, you can't say no. If you say no, he's not Lord. I want to ask you, are you following the king? Let's pray. Father, we stand in awe of you. I wish so well. I could have done it better. But would you take my fumbling remarks and God use them to speak to hearts? Would you draw that man that doesn't know you to Christ? Would you draw people who are saved, who are out of fellowship, restore the fellowship? Restore the unity of your church, oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Restore our church. Not only ours, but God bless every church where the gospel is being preached. We are right here. You do with us what you want to do. Here we are. As you speak, give us grace to respond, would you? We'll thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't believe we're here by accident today, but we're here by divine providence. Maybe God has spoken to you. You may just need to come to the altar and say, Lord, you know there's some areas in my life I haven't yielded to you. But today I do, today I do, today I do. He's worthy of that. You know that, don't you? Maybe you're not a Christian. You say, I've never bowed the knee to Christ, but you will one day. Why don't you do it today? Because today is the day of salvation. Why don't you do it? May you want to join our church. We'd welcome that. You may need prayer. Just come. Whatever. I'll be standing here. The deacons are here to pray with you. In fact, why don't you just punch your neighbor and say, will you go with me? Will you go with me? He'll come. She'll come. Let's stand together as we sing. You do whatever God lays on your heart to do as we sing.
King, tell somebody this week, he's my king. God bless you, you're dismissed.